Hi, folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really excited because I'm welcoming back C. Thomas Perry. We spoke to him a few months ago about his near-death experience, his NDE. And today I'm bringing him back because I want to talk about how that affected his perspectives on religion, on the Bible. And we're going to be touching on some really key points about the Bible, about humanity's beliefs in Christianity, about Jesus Christ himself, and of course about the Antichrist. And I wanted to just get his perspective after his NDE and see what has changed for him and like how it affected his life. So briefly, I just want to let you know quickly that C. Thomas Perry is a writer and a lecturer in media. He lives and works in Melbourne, Australia, and has a depth of experience in Christianity and the spiritual relevance of the message of God for the contemporary world. And that's what exactly what we're going to be honing in on today, because he has insights into the supernatural following his near-death experience, as I mentioned earlier. So today I welcome you to see Thomas Perry. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, I'm welcoming back Colin Perry. He's known as C. Thomas Perry. He is an author. He is a lecturer. He lives and works in Melbourne, Australia, and he has a depth of experience in Christianity and spiritual re relevance of the message of God of the contemporary world. He had an NDE, a near-death experience, and he's mm -hmm. going to explain that to you today. And then we're going to get into some deeper questions about Christianity, about the meaning of life, about the Bible, and just whatever we time grants us. So, Colin, if you can start, that would be great. Tell the folks what happened to you. Uh, what year was that again that you had your NDE? That was 2008. Um, seems like just yesterday to me, but like I'll it's bet. 15 years, 16 years ago. It's, <laughs> wow. it's a long time. Yeah, and just was. based on our past conversations, I know it still impacts your life every day uh, greatly. So give the folks a summary of what happened to you for those of us that have not heard it before. And uh, let us know about your book as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Look, um, as I said, it was 2008. And I to, to summarize it in a very short form. Basically, I, I was getting chest pains. My life wasn't in a great place. I was, uh, I was, although still believing in God, I wasn't very active in my faith, but, and uh, just basically was was feeling very distant from God. So at this point, I started to get chest pains, and, and uh, was a little worried about what was happening. And the doctor did some tests on me and said, uh, "Take it easy and relax for a while." Uh, just don't push yourself until we get the test results back. So I did relax for about a week and the results still weren't back. I, I was feeling better, so I thought I'd do some gardening. Went out and tried to start the, uh, the line trimmer machine thing. And it wouldn't start, of course. Uh, so I was pulling and pulling on the cord trying to start this machine. And um, as I was doing that, bang, I had a huge, huge, massive cramp across my chest and I knew straight away uh, this was a heart attack taking place. But while this happened, I heard the voice that could only have been the voice of God. It was so loud. It was so clear uh, and, and dominating. It was, a, it was a big voice. And he just said to me, uh, you are going to die, but I have things for you to do. And I was a little confused about that, as you can imagine, but he said, he just said to me very clearly, go inside, pack a bag, be ready, bring an ambulance. So I did that. I managed to stagger inside and pack some things and call an ambulance, and uh, they came very quickly and took me off, gave me morphine and uh, nitroglycerol, which is standard procedure. And then on the way, they gave me some more morphine, and I knew I was going to pass out. I could feel myself going, and I did. I blacked out. Little did I know at the time that my heart had actually stopped. So I was, I was actually dead. And I was just floating in, in this darkness. Very pleasant experience, actually. I was just floating and like I was floating in water, weightless. No sensation, no pain, nothing like that. 
And uh, after a little while, I realized, oh, I, I think I'm actually dead and started to be afraid and to drift downwards and, and uh, became aware of this black nothing void beneath me that was very frightening. And I, be I became quite afraid to think that I was sinking down into this. And I thought, no, this is not how the script is supposed to go. Uh, and having been a Christian most of my life, I just screamed out to Jesus. I just said, Jesus, come and help me. And continued to drift downward for a while. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, this hand just, just grabbed my wrist and he said, you don't want to go that way. And started to pull me upward. And, and this was very rapid. Uh, I, I was traveling at some incredible speed through what I don't know. Uh, everything was just blurring past me. And I eventually found myself in this beautiful, well-lit, cloudy sort of environment with a group of about six or seven angels just standing around me. There was no question they were angels. I just knew it at the moment I was with them. Uh, and... I was then given the choice um, and Jesus just basically said to me, it's your choice. You can come on with us into paradise or you can, you can go back uh, and resume your life. And he actually said to an angel, go and check the vessel was the word he used. Uh, so one angel flew off. I could see myself, my body in the distance, and the angel was in the ambulance checking out my body to see how things were. Um, but the, the thing that really impacted me the most about this was there was no speaking, there was no words, it was all direct communication of what we were thinking. I just knew what they were thinking, they knew what I was thinking, so our thoughts were directly communicating. But um, more importantly, the, the feeling of love was something I just still to this day struggle to explain. There was this massive feeling of warmth and glowing love in my chest that just I felt as if my chest was going to explode, that it was so powerful. Uh, and I, I was just overwhelmed by this love. It was beautiful. It was the best experience I can ever imagine having. And uh, this was just emanating from Jesus and the angel and just flooding me with their love, uh, bigger love than I've ever experienced here on earth, that's for sure. Uh, and... This was beautiful, and Jesus said to me, I, I need to come in and do some healing. You've had some big grief in your life, which I had. My daughter had been hit by a car when she was seven, was profoundly brain injured. About a year after this event, she actually passed away, a poor little kid. But uh, she was uh, very much something I felt I couldn't leave behind. And I had children. I had an 8-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old. I, I just thought, no, I, I can't just leave my kids so I thought, I do have to go back. But let me tell you, I did not want to go back. It was so beautiful. It was so good. It was everything I'd ever hoped for or imagined was, was how I felt. It was being at home. Uh, that's the only way I can put it. It was, it was the most comfortable being at home, loved experience you could ever imagine. Um, quite a few things happened while I was there. Um, they, Jesus came into me and did this amazing sort of healing process on me. And for a few seconds, I was actually joined to him. He actually came into my soul and I could feel him inside me shifting things and restoring me and, and uh, rearranging what was going on inside of my spiritual being. And uh, just for those few seconds, I could actually feel and understand his awareness and, and the scale of his power. And the scale of his majesty was just mind-boggling. It was so huge and all-encompassing. Uh, so that is one thing that has changed me for life, just that, that awareness of who Jesus is and what sort of power he holds was a real eye-opener for me. It was enormous. Um, to, to cut the story a little short, they showed me things in my life that would have come the angel came back and said, yes, the, the vessel is good. The body is okay. So, and Jesus said to me, we're going to send you back, but you need to make good decisions. He was saying, whether you come back here or not will depend on your decisions, whether you stay uh, connected with me or whether you go off and forget about me and live your life. 
He said, I can't guarantee which way that's going to go. That is up to you and the decisions that you make and the choices you make in your life, which was a, a very, very good reminder for me to have and it's never left me. So uh, basically I, I found myself floated again and bang, I was back in my body and it was, it was like hitting concrete coming back into my body. I took a big breath, but the whole environment being back in a human body on Earth in comparison was not pleasant. It felt heavy, clumsy, and and evil. It just felt evil in comparison. That that environment was so full of love and goodness and, and happiness and everything you can ever imagine that you like, whereas being here in comparison, just, just not, not good at all. Um, and my chest was hurting again, and uh, I could just sense, oh, boy, here I am back here. Have I made the right decision leaving that beautiful place and coming back here to Earth? But, look, I will say this. Having experienced that, even though I was a mid-heart attack in an ambulance, I did not feel any fear of death at that point in time, whereas beforehand I had been quite afraid. All fear had left me. It was just, oh, if I, if I die and go back there, wonderful. I'd be only too happy to be there. Uh, but I, I sort of knew that wouldn't happen because they told me I, they were sending me back. Um, I, I, I then said to the ambulance operator, uh, I must have been gone for a long time. Uh, a lot of things have happened. And he just looked at me quizzically and said, no, you've only been out for one minute. And I was absolutely staggered at this because... It felt to me with the experiences, the amount of things I had been through, conversations, etc. It felt like I'd been gone for around about half an hour. Uh, but he said, no, you, you, you've been, your heart stopped one minute ago. And he was holding defibrillator pads and was about to uh, zap me with the defibrillator. So it was intriguing to me that the time scales were so different between what I had experienced and what was happening on Earth, as I will say. Look, that's the story. I've, I've actually written it up and a lot of other things in this, this book, Dying to be Alive, uh, see Thomas Perry, and you can get that on Amazon or, or at Ex Libris, who are the publishers. You'll get best deal out of Ex Libris if you look it up there. Uh, yeah, please have a read because there's a lot of information in this, not only about my NDE, but about the things that, that have happened in my life, the questions it raised to me. I'll continue to have visions and dreams and things like that that, that are very much on, on that spiritual realm. And uh, this book's got a lot of that information written in. So treat yourself to it and find out a few more things. I'll make sure I put links uh, running across the screen as well as in the description of uh, the video. So I'll make sure that folks uh, do get a chance to read that. Your story is so powerful. Every time I hear it, it's like I'm hearing it for the first time. It's it's inc it's a miracle. Um, I I think definitely a miracle. <laughs> so to get started, I wanted to, you know, your insights into the like the supernatural following your near death experience continues to offer you this profound view, right, about death, life, eternity, Christianity, and the deep questions about why we're here say right so i i want i want to kind of pick your brain a little bit because we i don't think we really got a chance to talk about that um at, right after your nde how long uh did it take you before you really started to like pick up the bible and become familiar with it like what was that process like for you Oh, that's amazing. Uh, as I hit my body back in the ambulance, they took me to hospital and uh, they performed an operation where they put a, a stent in my heart. Uh, one of the first things I did when one of my friends visited me was to say, bring my Bible in, which he did. And, and straight away I started to just throw my Bible open and everywhere I opened it was about being resurrected from the dead. I just couldn't get away from it. I, I must have done it 10 times. Every single time, my eye fell straight on a verse that was talking about resurrection from the dead, like Lazarus being raised, Jesus being raised, things in Psalm 30, Psalm 16, just all these different things that say, you know, I will not suffer your body to see corruption in Sheol. 
uh, you know, uh, things like that just kept on coming up. And I, I actually was playing with it. I was saying, I'm going to try and find a verse that is not about being resurrected from the dead. And it wouldn't happen. Every single time I opened my Bible, there was one of those verses there. Like it was totally supernatural and freakish. I, I cannot have any explanation for it apart from that God was just manipulating every little event at that point in time. Um, so, look, the Bible, I grew up reading the Bible. I was brought up in a very conservative Christian household uh, and read the Bible a lot, so I didn't know it. But this totally reinvigorated my my desire to know what was there. And having had this experience has, has totally changed and enhanced my understanding of what the Bible is saying. Uh, a lot of things we just read out of like a religious tradition, but when you experience the reality of what it's talking about, it's another book. It's entirely another book. And you start to realise just how significant angelic intervention has been in human history and and how important the uh, the role of Jesus ascending to, to the heavenly has been. Uh, those sorts of things I can never understand in the same way since that experience. It's just totally... Um, totally changed my perception of it. Is that the bo both the Old and New Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Uh, the Old Testament has so many uh, records of, of God taking human form, talking to Moses, talking to, to Abraham, uh, angels coming and going, uh, an angel wrestling Jacob, uh, um, angels appearing to David, uh, all sorts of things that were going on. Uh, this ongoing dialogue between heaven and earth. And that's what I've really come to understand a lot better since then. Also that we, we I, I think of us, and I, there's a chapter in my book about this, I, I believe we are like a portal between earth and heaven. We have the receptors within us that is in touch with heavenly beings and the heavenly realm. Uh, and we just, are not aware of it unless we actually open our eyes and practice it. And I think that's what Jesus was saying when he said, you know, you who have ears to hear, hear. You have eyes to see, see. He was talking about this awareness of the spiritual that uh, that we all have, but it's just lying dormant within us. How do we get to that? How, is it just reading the Bible that brings us closer to that? I absolutely believe the Bible is a completely supernatural book. Uh, the, the number of times, as I've said, you know, where I've just opened it and things have spoken to me directly about a situation I'm in right at that point in time, uh, beyond count. There's so many times this has happened to me. More than that, I just believe it, it, it holds so much wisdom. This is a book written over 4,000 years with just so much um information in it and so much spiritual insight into, into things beyond what we can understand. And it continues to go. I think it's still the best-selling book in the world. Oh, yeah, uh, it is. After all this time. Uh, and it just continues to change people's lives and to intervene and, and to uh, give people so much hope, to give people so much uh, belief and faith that they wouldn't otherwise have um, the Bible is an amazing chronicle of, of God's work on earth. Now, obviously, you've read the Bible through and through a few times. Are you still in that mode where you find yourself always picking the book up and, and just starting at the beginning? Or are there certain chapters that have a special meaning for you? Uh, look, over the last few years, I've just been... In the new year, I'll just say, okay, start at Genesis and, and I'll just read my way through the Bible as the year goes, generally finishing it by sometime just before Christmas. Uh, so I just keep reading it every year uh, and I'm continuing to find new things every time. It's not like you've read a story and you read the story and you understand it. It, it continually opens up new questions and and. Uh, new issues that as you mature and as you come to greater understanding in your life, it, it, there's content in there that just speaks to you in a particular way, in particular parts of the book. Like I, I particularly love Psalms, King David's writings, um, so in touch with, with the emotions uh, and 
the whole uh, belief in God through difficult times. It doesn't pull any punches. It's not always the most cheery uh, book to read, right. but it deals with the deep things. There are really deep things in your life. It deals with depression. Um, like some of the Psalms, he says, why are you so downcast, my soul? I will yet live. I will yet praise the Lord. You know, he's, he's giving strategies for, for dealing with depression, for dealing with difficult times, um, which is very valuable. And so many people do need that in their lives. Uh, that, oh, yeah. That's just one, one little example of it. But right throughout, uh, I think of verses like Romans chapter 12 that says, um, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is this is what the Bible is really all about. It's about changing your way of thinking. It's about um, coming to understand life in a different way. We are not necessarily masters of our own destiny, but that God is in control of every moment, every breath, and every event that happens in our lives. So... A lot of people get confused because they feel if God is in control of every waking moment of our lives, how does free will come into that? Because even in your NDE, Jesus yeah. said to you, right, that he can't guarantee how it's going to turn out. That's up to you. How does that? When I say, that? yeah, when I say God is in control, I don't mean as in a remote control with a robot. Uh, no, we are not. We, we have our own free will. Let's. He uses the the metaphor of, of a father with children, and he he is the father, and we are the children. He's offering us guidance. He's offering us uh, protection. He's helping us in every aspect of our lives that we can allow him to. Uh, but it is still our life, and it is still our choices that we apply. That's the sort of control I'm talking about. He won't force himself on people apart from some particular circumstances, but most of the time it's up to us what we choose, but he's trying to give us guidance in a particular direction that is right for our lives. Uh, that's the best way I could put it, really. That but it is free will. Yeah. So there's something... Um, important to me personally too that i want to ask you um there's like a global awakening happening and i'm sure you you know all about it saw it on social media read about it in articles um some of that has to do with uh like new age spirituality stuff so like i'll see people working with crystals um not like not magic things, but like calling upon your energy, your vibration and that kind of new age stuff in the Bible. Um, it clearly states that any of that stuff is is like, I guess, demonic. Right. So like, um, well, we all know Ouija boards are and stuff, but there are people that claim they do use Ouija boards for good and not for evil. But so g given that. How do you think that fits when, like, I met someone who was profoundly religious. They believe Jesus is our, our Lord and Savior. They pray every day, but yet they call themselves a spiritual medium. And they claim to speak to deceased people and get intuitive, like clairvoyant things. I I'm trying to see what your take is on this whole New agey kind of spiritualism. How does that connect? Okay. Well, it's a very broad world we're talking yeah. about there when we're talking about new age spiritualism. Um, look, there are certain things in the Bible, and I'm absolutely with it. There are very severe warnings about communicating with the dead. It, it says it's something God hates. No. It's something something we are not to do, particularly in the Old Testament. It's part of the Jewish law. You do not consult mediums. You do not speak to the dead. For example, um, King Saul, when he, he was a rather impatient king and he wanted answers from Samuel and from God, and he decided he was going to go and consult um, a witch and uh, a medium and, and try to speak to Samuel. And she brought Samuel up from the dead 
And Samuel was furious. The spirit of Samuel was furious with Saul for doing that and said, I tear, you know, the kingdom is torn away from you. You, you, you don't have your kingdom anymore. Uh, and God's going to give to someone else, which was David. Uh, so there was this definite no, 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 don't do this about consulting the spirits of the dead in the Bible and in Christianity. Uh, unquestionably, it, it's it's something that is listed among things, both Old and New Testament, listed among things you just should not do. Uh, so I think in terms of, yeah, consulting the spirits of the dead, no, that's something to be definitely avoided. The great majority of New Age mysticism is, is, like you say, more to do with energies and things like that. And, and I think, look, I, I would say a very high percentage of people in the New Age movement have come out of the church, have been disillusioned with the structures of the church, the way it works, the sort of judgmental approach, um, the, the basic hypocrisy that seems to go on amongst the church. And um, they have become very disillusioned and gone to something that is attractive and sexy and fashionable, right? right? And it's something they can do without feeling ashamed. They, they feel it's cool to be into this stuff, crystals and, and vibrations and all those sorts of things and dream catches, etc. But I don't think that stuff in itself is particularly harmful. I think it's it's a poor imitation of the real thing, which is the Holy Spirit and the power of God and the vibration of God, which is very real. Right. Uh, and I think they're looking, because they miss that, that is the one thing they miss about what was in the church, that they did have this feeling of there is a God, there is something I'm attached to that, that, is, that is larger than me, that is, that is a wonderful... Uh, force, a wonderful being. So they're looking for a way to express that that is not confused with the church thing, which, as we know, in contemporary society is considered quite unfashionable and uncool. People who are Christians are often sort of labelled as loonies um, or God botherers or, or whatever else name people want to give them. So people are looking for a way to seek God without being associated with that. I think that's at the core of what the New Age movement's all about. Um, I, I just think it's a poor alternative, to be honest. Uh, having experienced direct, direct communication with God through through what happened to me, I, I just think you know a vibration. Yeah, great. Let's talk about actually a being who comes into your life, does things, helps you, actively speaks to you, and really works in your life. To, to help you out and to bring you onto a higher higher plane of understanding and of spiritual existence. That's the sort of God I'm talking about. Um, look, I believe God still tries to communicate with these people. Uh, I do. I don't think everything is just automatically satanic if it's not of the Christian church. I think there are some aspects of it that are quite good. The, for example, the, the, just the concept of loving people is itself a God concept. Um, that is the commandment that Jesus gave us, the great commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. That, that's a really good thing. And if people are practising that and living that, well, that is a good thing. But um, I don't really hold much store by by the crystals and vibrations and dream catches and, yeah. and those sorts of things. Yeah, I, I think they're just basically trinkets to make people feel good. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, because there are other, obviously, religions that do use these different types of, of things, crystals and whatever, and they're profoundly good, decent, loving, God-fearing people. So I, I, I totally agree with that point. So, But you're saying that like anybody that professes to be like a medium and communicate with the dead, that's an absolute no-no according to the Bible. Absolutely. According to the Bible, definitely no. Don't, don't go there. The reason being you are, you are opening up, not to the heavenly realms but you are opening up to the realms of the dead you are opening up to the lower realms and things come through from that realm that are not good for us to have in right. our lives uh, and often I've, I've known people who've done this and bad things start happening to them um, and I just think well, yeah. stay clear stay do you think clear. it's okay to talk to uh, our deceased loved ones it, it Oh yeah, that's that's, that's a different, different thing. I think just just that's talking different. to them in our mind, yeah, no, no, we're not actually calling up a spirit. No, this, but 
Right. Yeah, this is this is the difference, okay? Um, just talking to someone in your mind, that there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think just literally addressing a dead relative or something like that, just just saying a few things to them, I can't see that there's anything wrong with that. Okay. Whereas if you were to get a Ouija board and start to say, right. now, tell me what's happening, tell me this, tell me that, that's a different thing. You're actually consulting a spirit and asking it to guide your life. That's where you get into dangerous territory. That makes do you really, sense. Do you really know who you're talking to or is this a spiritual right. entity easily able to read your mind and, and manipulate you? So that would be my warning in those sorts of areas. And, and a lot of these demonic forces are tricksters. You don't know who you're talking to when you, so that makes, that makes total sense. So let's talk about angels. Um, one of the other things that, that I see a lot and hear a lot about is that we all have spirit guides or angelic guides. Is that true? Does the Bible say that we're, we're all given the gift of these angelic beings and that like we're assigned beings? Like, how does that work? Look, there is definitely uh, evidence in the Bible for this. It talks about uh, their angel. We're talking about individual people, like their angels. So there is a couple of mentions of that in the Bible, definitely. Uh, the angelic realm is, is a huge realm. I mean, it's massive. It, it's larger than, than what we experience on Earth. That's that's my uh, understanding of it. Uh, and, and even in the Bible, there's talk of their uh, archangels like there's a whole hierarchy of angels there are archangels that are over particular realms and authorities and nations and things like this so there's quite a structure of authorities in the angelic realm so there, there are the individual angels who i guess at the lower scale lower down the ranks and then there are the the high up the mighty ones that we would call archangels that are over huge dominions and, and authorities um, so it's a very complex world and not one that we can hope to easily understand. I think it's they're basically one thing I did find when I was with them is that I felt this big in their presence. I'm not talking physically, I'm talking mentally, spiritually. I felt like an infant. These beings are so wise. They have such incredible depth of knowledge, understanding and experience. They are eternal beings. Next to them, we are very, very small. Uh, and that's something I think we need to understand about, that if we are privileged enough to have an angel assigned to us, that is an amazing thing because they will help to guide us and, and help us through. Uh, spirit guides I'm worried about, if they're not angels as such, what are they? Uh, and that that does worry me. We don't know who we're dealing with. It, it, as I said, it's a complex, multi-layered world of dimensions and the heavenly and the underworld both exist. Uh, do you know that your so-called spirit guide is actually a heavenly being? How do you know it? What goes on? How does it affect your life? I would be very cautious about taking on spirit guides. Uh, we don't know who they are. So that that's... My, my little warning, I guess, if you're going to be a, a Christian, you definitely want to be sure it's angels you're talking to. Uh, that, that is an important thing. Yeah, I'd be very wary of beings coming saying they were uh, an ancient Indian from 500 BC. Uh, you know, I'd be very wary of that. We yeah. don't know where that's coming from. Uh, what, does the, what does the Bible say about, if at all, reincarnation you hear so it much of it. it just doesn't <laughs> it just doesn't talk about it uh, and i am absolutely confident if it was a reality that that it would be talked about in the bible but it's not um the in fact there's indications the other way for example when people have ndes and this is not only christian ndes this is everybody's ndes mm -hmm. they meet their old relatives they re meet their ancestors. I, I could feel my family when I was there. I could feel them around. I couldn't see them, but I, I knew they were there. Uh, if they're there, well, what's the story with reincarnation? Why would they be there if there's reincarnation? But all of these NDEs, people meet their dead relatives. 
Uh, and that, to me, is a strong indication, no, they're not just recycling through another wife, another wife, another wife. That I don't think is the case. There's also um, bits in the Bible, particularly in Revelation, talk one, one place where it talks about the souls of the dead beneath the throne of heaven calling out, saying, how long, O Lord, until you restore things? So, I mean, if there's reincarnation, they, they would not necessarily be there. They'd right. be back in a, in a human body again. And so I, I don't think the Bible supports it at all. That's good to know. It, it's just, I, I can understand why it's so confusing for people, especially the past few years, everybody is searching for like this deeper meaning to our existence. And a lot of folks are turning to this new agey kind of thing. And you see it all over social media where you have people that are uh, supposedly they have like spirits in them and they're talking, whether they're aliens from out of space or I don't know what they are. And they they kind of have them talking to people, but it's all good stuff. Like it's not, you don't hear anything demonic. So people can easily get trapped into, you know, that whole thing. I could see where that, where that would happen. Yeah, look, there's there's an interesting verse in the Bible. I can't think of exactly where it is, but it says, um, even Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. Mm. So I, I don't think these people know who or what they're talking to. I don't think they've got any idea. If they just accept it on face value, well, they're not being very cautious and they're not right. being very, very clever about it. The Bible comes with warnings about testing the spirits. Mm. Test them and see and basically, the, the thing to ask them is, you know, did Jesus Christ come to earth? Is Jesus Christ in flesh? Did he have a flesh body? Is he human? If they deny that and fight against that fact, well, the Bible tends to indicate they're not of God. They're not of the heavenly realm. And, and we need to be careful. Uh, look, look, I'm not, I'm not the sort of Christian that goes around saying everything except us is demonic. No. But there is the demonic, and it is there, and we do have to be very careful of it. Uh, I've seen people under demonic influence, and it's not a pleasant thing to fall under that. Um, and and uh, that's something we just need to be aware of and exercise caution and don't just swallow it without really understanding what it is that you're dealing with. You don't it's want to It's very scary. To yeah, it's very yeah. scary stuff. Um, I recently saw a girl who, who used to be a witch, and she found Jesus, thank God, and completely changed her life. And she said when she was putting or trying to put hexes on people, the one barrier that that she couldn't break through was when they were praying. She said there was yes. no way that she could hex them or break through to them during prayer. So let's talk about prayer a little bit. Um, there's been... And, and I think it's great, a, a big revival for folks getting rebaptized or baptized for the first time. How do you, how do you pray, Colin? And what does prayer mean to you personally? Well, prayer, it's, it goes beyond what the traditional understanding of it is. Like, usually it's, God, I love you. God, can you do this for me? God, can you do that for me, Lord? Can you help this person? Can you help that person? That is one level of prayer, yes. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. It is great. It is good to make your requests known to God. And that is like the first introductory level of prayer. But as, as you pray more and more, it starts to become a two-way experience. And things start to appear in your mind that you know have not come from you God starts to talk to you in ways that, that are very easy to understand once you get to know them. Uh, it, it first of all sounds like your own thoughts, and it, but then you later on when you analyse it, you realise, hang on a minute, I, I wouldn't think that or know that or understand that. How did that just appear in my head while I was praying? And, and that's the sort of level of prayer that I think after a period of time when you've opened up that portal, opened up that channel to God, that he starts to feed back into your life through that. Uh, and it's no longer just 
God, please give me this. God, please do that, which is sort of the childhood prayers that we're, um, we're asked for. Not saying they're not valid. They most certainly are. But it's when when you feel God start to impact your life, and start to change things in you and to, to change your own being spiritually, that's when prayer becomes extremely powerful. I, I think in, in modern terms, I, I think I would call prayer telepathic communication. I, I really believe that's what it is, uh, which is what was like in, when I was in the heavenly realm with the angels and with Jesus. It was direct soul-to-soul communication. And that's what I believe prayer is. For me, that's changed my understanding of prayer entirely. So uh, I believe angels still talk into my life now. Jesus still talks into my life now. And there's nothing creepy or weird about that. It's just a, a wonderful thing. Um, it's talked about a lot in the Bible, how, how angels will tell people to do things, instruct them to go here or do that. That's not uncommon. Uh, so for Christianity, for those who are, really spiritually active Christians, that's how I see prayer. It, it's really talking to and listening to God simultaneously. Wow. Um, what about church? Because a lot of people are very close to Jesus and believe he's their Lord and Savior, but they don't necessarily go to church. What's your take mm. on that? Like to Matt Sunday. The church, I think, is partly to blame for this. Uh, I was thinking about this just just, uh, just yesterday when Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. Okay, now leaven is yeast, and, and we're talking about it being mixed in, and he was talking teachings and traditions. Uh, one of the things about the, the Pharisees that he disliked the most was their judgmental nature. Uh, these these people are sinners. Get back from me. Uh, he actually spoke directly against that in his parables and said the man who God loved is the one that says, forgive me, I'm a sinner, not the one who says, keep me clean from these sinners. And I think the church has fallen directly into that trap. I think a lot of churches actually run that pharisaical uh, dialogue, really. It's it's about stay clean, don't, don't be touched by evil, stay separate. And be pure and be good, and uh, and stay away from all the all the evil in the world. Uh, and that's not what Jesus taught at all. He was accused of eating with you know publicans and tax collectors and sinners. He mixed in with people, uh, and that's where I think the church has really adopted this Pharisaical position, become very judgmental. Um, also falling for this terrible thing of unless you think exactly the same as I do, then you're going to hell. Right. A and right. that worries me intensely. I, I, that, that's a manipulation, I think, that's come down from the, the Catholic Church at its worst phase when people were being charged money to go to heaven um, and, and people were just basically being manipulated with fear and intimidation. And that, to me, is something that the church should wipe off the books. I think it's alienated so many people beyond count. Uh, it's it's not about you'll go to hell if you're bad. That may be the case. I'm not 100% sure. But that, Jesus only said that about those who are really doing evil. Okay? He didn't say that about average everyday people. He, he was talking about those who chose evil, those who chose to do evil. Uh when, when he's talking about heaven and hell, he's really talking about, do you want to be accepted? Do you want to get into the heavenly? That's where his emphasis lies. Uh, what, what must I do to get into the heavenly realm? And he's giving instruction on, on how to be in touch with it, uh, using metaphors like keeping your lamp filled with oil, you know, like keeping your faith high, keeping keeping in touch with God, the prayer things we've just been talking about, keeping those very present in your life. On the other hand, the Bible does say uh, church is a great thing, but I think you've got to be very careful there's church and there's church. There's very dominating uh, structural churches that are all about rules and regulations, and I don't believe that's what the church of Jesus really is about. The Church of Jesus is about forgiveness, it's about love, it's about helping the poor and the needy and the sick. 
it's about healing, it's about care. They're the sorts of churches you need to be involved in and churches that have active spiritual activity, Holy Spirit activity. Uh, it's not just a tradition. It's not just a turn up on Sunday and, and light a candle. It, it's actually be engaged with God and know God in your heart and in your soul. If there's a church that's encouraging you in that direction, yes, be involved. It's wonderful. Uh, but be careful of the traditions of man uh, because that that can hold you back terribly uh, just going through the traditions rather than right. living the experience of God. Right. Well, what do you think the best way or best things we could do to know God? I mean, following his commandments, being just being a good person, I mean, we're all just getting up every day, living our lives, working. You know, we're not doing, hopefully, harm to other people. You try to help your friends and your family. You try to live your your life with love and decency. Are those the things, do you think? It's, it's interesting, yeah. Look, look, the way the Bible talks about it, it says, look, even the bad guys do that. Even the bad guys love their own family. Right. Even the bad guys care for their own people. Right. That's good. That's a good starting point. But God's calling us to go beyond that. Um, God's God's calling us to love those that hate us. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. That is a challenge. Right? So it, it's not just about loving the people that it's convenient to love. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That is great. But it's about how do you respond to the, the more conflicting situations where people maybe... Uh, attacking you or harassing you or things like that. How do you respond in those circumstances? Um, um, like yeah, Democrats what, what, and Republicans? Oh, I, I, I weep for America. <laughs> do you, looking it's at it from good. a distance. Uh, I, I actually think social media is responsible for this to a large extent and the algorithms it. because everybody selects, you know, and it gives them what they want to hear. So if you if you click on all the Republican stuff, you're going to get all the Republican stuff. You're not right. going to hear what the other side has to say at all. And it's gradually polarising and pulling apart American society from what I can see so, to these two extremes uh, where there's this huge chasm opening up in the middle. Uh, and it's concerning. You know, I think it's very concerning. I agree. I mean, there are some things that we clearly... Don't see eye to eye, like things like abortion and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are some some very pressing, uh, you know, beliefs that can keep you from wanting to communicate with these people because they're very stuck in believing in their their ways and ideologies. And, and so are the Republicans. So that's mm. that's a tough one. It's a, it's not only the United States either. It's 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 all oh, yes. Well, I, I think yeah. it's more um, more exaggerated at the yes, moment in the United absolutely. States than in most other places, and more absolutely. public. We're all hearing about it quite a lot. Um, yeah, look, it, it's a really complex issues yes. involved, particularly with abortion and things like that. Yeah. But look, I think the Bible's pretty clear on it. I am I am anti-abortion, but I am not necessarily anti-all across the board right. without any qualifications. I, I think there are some circumstances where you've got to say, okay, the uh, action needs to be taken in that sort of circumstance. I won't go into the details of that because it's just so fraught with, with oh, difficulty yeah. in those it directions. Is. It is. But, but I think any, anything where you take an absolutist position without making any allowances, I, I think that's that's a problem. That's yeah, parasitic, I as, as I was talking about. Uh, and there has to be some circumstances where, you know, maybe it is the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's tough. It, it's very interesting in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the end times, and, and it, um, it lists three things, and, and it's, it's talking about the very end of time, at the end of the age, and, and the final if you like, punishment or judgment of the earth. And uh, it talks about, and the people of the earth refuse to stop three things. It's, it's Revelation chapter 19, and, and it says their, their sorcery, their murders, and their fornication. Oh. 
And when you actually go in and look at those words, it's it's very, very interesting looking at them in, in the Greek. The the word for sorcery is actually pharmakia. Right. Pharma pharmakia. Drug taking. Yep. yep. Drug taking, right? Right. Um, the word for murder is just, yeah, well, that's just murder. Um, right. And one wonders if that is talking about uh, pre preborn babies. I mean, the numbers of babies that are aborted is horrific. I, I it scares me. I, yeah. I think it's. I can't imagine God being able to do it with what's going on. Um, and then there's the the fornication, which is a very broad word. Once again, she's talking about sexual immorality in general, right? And 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 saying, well, God wants us to stop these things this is what he wants us to actually cease on the earth and uh we're not listening we're not listening no. we're, we're us using our rational arguments against it fighting against what god's asking us to do basically saying god doesn't exist why should i listen to that right and, and at a certain point i mean if if revelation as i believe is absolutely true there's going to come a time when there'll be a standoff between humanity and god and god will be saying you are bringing judgment on yourselves. You are bringing destruction on yourselves by the way you are living. It's as if um, it, it talks in the Bible many places about the land bearing the weight of the sin of the people that live in that land. And, and it causes disasters. It causes things to go wrong because it's, it's a negative energy. If you want to talk sure. spiritual terms, yeah. it's a negative energy that brings on disaster and destruction. And, and um, we, we see that, I think, quite often. Let's talk about the Antichrist a little bit. Uh, I've read so mm. much about it. And tell us what, what you think and what the Bible says, you know, with the 666, the mark of the beast and the whole, what's your take yeah. on that whole thing? Oh, yeah, I, I really, I am intrigued by this whole thing. Look, it, it says very clearly at the end of the age, whatever, whatever that is and whenever that is, I don't presume to know, certain things are going to happen. Um, there's going to be a, um, a person, a king, a force, I'm not sure exactly what shape it will take, that will be just as Jesus was the personification and the, the human version of God, this will be the human version of the devil. This will be a human being who is uh, here to deceive, destroy, and kill, and mess everything up. Uh, I think Adolf Hitler was a pretty strong prototype of what this person will be like. They will appear to be a saviour. They will appear to be a great leader who, who has achieved mighty things but actually is bringing about the most massive destruction and evil. Uh, and that's what I think we're in for at some stage. Um, the 666 thing now, what it's basically saying is it looks as if there's going to be a universal credit money system. It looks as if, and it talks about a mark on the forearm, the forehead. I mean, there was a lot of people, anti-vaxxers, saying the vaccine was the mark. No, sorry, sorry. No, no. It's to do with buying and selling, but also to do with worship of the beast. In, in the book of Revelation. So if someone has the mark of the beast, they are choosing to worship the beast as God. I, I see it as being like a quasi-religious type organisation mixed in with government. I, I guess a bit like the sort of communist Stalin Mao sort of, sort of figures who were both ahead of government but were also ahead of worship. It literally was worship in the case of Mao, you know, just singing their praises, sort of bowing down to images of them, et cetera, et cetera. I, I see perhaps it'll be something like that if it comes along, someone claiming to be a godlike figure, much like the old Caesars were in Rome. Uh, it, I don't see it now. I, I certainly see things heading in that direction and, and one of the things that worries me is, is the demise of cash the credit system becoming more and more powerful they already have chips that you can put in you that can hold all your financial information uh, uh, i think it's quite feasible that this could be done at any point in, in the near future um but i won't call that until it happens you know uh, we'll, we'll know when it happens because this will be a very powerful force in the world it won't just be something small that we might miss right so you don't think that this antichrist is is walking the earth now could well be 
Yeah, could well be. Could well be. I just don't know. Uh, I'm not willing to make huge calls like that. They're, they're, they're the sort of secrets that only God really knows. Uh, and maybe maybe some people in the know if, if they're making plans. But uh, it, it's going to be a very challenging time for the world. It says everyone in the world will be forced to wear this mark and to worship the beasts or they'll be killed, basically. So it's not going to be something you miss easily. Uh, and that will be a very challenging time when that comes about. Uh, but, look, I think that will come about as a result of extreme circumstances that we just have not seen yet. Yeah. Well, they're already microchipping brains and, you know, Elon Musk is working on that. And like you said, we already have access to microchips in our hands. So it's not looking too good. It's kind of scary times for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I think I think just the thing to be aware of is, is it's very doom and gloom. The Antichrist, the end of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But keep in mind that um, the Bible talks about this as the last of the birth pangs of the earth. The earth is going into labour when this happens because it's about to give birth to something new and wonderful and incredibly good. So it, it's like that, that agony of childbirth, but then once the child is born, it is, it is totally beautiful and totally different. And that's the picture that the Bible paints about all of this. It's going to be terribly hard, but it's going to be a transition from the kingdom of evil to the kingdom of light. And that after this time, the earth will be restored to its its almost its garden of Eden form. It will be it will be a wonderful place to be. And uh, there will be love between people, wars will cease quite clearly clearly written. You can see it written outside the United Nations in New York. You know, they'll beat their beat their swords into plowshares. And, and that's the sort of future that is coming after this time. So I don't like to get too obsessed with the, the Antichrist and end of times things. They're coming. They will come. We'll know about them when they come. Jesus said it's like when when lightning flashes from the east to the west. You are not going to miss it. It's going to be big. But the thing to keep in mind is just when things seem at their darkest and most evil is the time when salvation comes near, when the change of the earth into the kingdom of God is imminent. Mm -hmm. right? um, that's what I think we need to keep in mind. And I know we're getting close to the end of our hour, but what about the rapture? What's your take okay. on it? No, I, I believe something akin to this. I, I don't know exactly what form it will take, uh, but there is certainly in the Bible very clear indications that we, you know we will be lifted. Those who believe in the Lord will be lifted. Those who are chosen to go up will be lifted, and that, that's in what First Thessalonians chapter five, I believe, uh, and and insinuated all over the place uh, that that this will happen. This is going to be an entirely supernatural event. This is not going to be anything that happens um, without people noticing. It, it will be a huge event. This is, I don't think it's necessarily going to come just in the middle of a downtown day in New York. I, I think it's going to be in the middle of a very extreme set of circumstances, as, as the books of the Bible tend to indicate, uh, perhaps when many Christians' lives are in, in great danger. Uh, perhaps when many may have been killed or were looking like they're going to be killed or whatever. Uh, Jesus says several times, you know, if I would not return to the earth, no life would survive. They are his words. So he's leaving it until the very last minute, until things are at the most extreme and then intervene. And that's his promise to the world. Uh, so things need to get very bad, I think, before this situation takes place. I don't think we're there yet. But honestly, it could happen very easily. Right. Uh, for example, in, for example, in Revelation, it's very clear that an object. A lot of people think this is figurative. I do not. I think this is literal. An object will fall from heaven and strike the earth, causing massive earthquakes, causing the sky to go dark, causing the sun to to turn to blood. Uh, causing the, the oceans to heave and toss and in great turmoil and the mountains to be moved and the cities to crumble. 
and they're the things it lists as a result of this event. Now, um, if something like that occurs, as is definitely predicted, then yes, we will be in extremely dire circumstances. And that's that's very literally what the book of Revelation says is going to happen. Uh, a lot of people tend to explain it away as, oh, it's figured if it's talking about right. political powers. Not I, I don't believe so. It's it's too accurate. Yeah. What was, what was written down 2,000 years ago is a perfect description of what would happen if a large asteroid or, or comet were to strike the Earth. Yeah. It's, it's scientifically immaculate, what it actually says. And that indicates to me, yeah, it, it's actually predicting that event. And this is the, the final judgment of, of God on the right. earth and the final reason for the transition into the next phase. But uh, during the rapture, do we leave body and spirit or do our bodies stay here and our spirit ascends? That's a, that's a tough question. I believe our bodies ascend. Mm. I, I believe literally our bodies ascend. Like this is not unknown in the Bible. It happened to Elijah. It happened to Jesus. It's just being lifted. Uh, how that works, I don't know, but I, yeah. I know God is capable of absolutely anything. Um, but that's what I believe it would be, the literal physical bodies being lifted off so that we won't be around for what happens at a particular point in time. Wow. That's surely something to think about. So what, what are you working on now? I know last time we spoke, you said you had another book inside of you did you get it's, started it, <laughs> look it's uh, it's in bits and pieces i'm beginning to uh, i'd like to write about the sorts of things we're talking about today uh, i'd like to write on that level not so much necessarily i mean about the mde but about these sorts of things and about yes. the understandings i have as a result of the MDE and how it's opened up my perceptions of what the bible say um but it's going to be a a grand opus <laughs> when I write it. I think it would be an but excellent idea. Yeah, that's it's sort of what I want to talk about. It's just like, okay, this is this is how I understand what the Bible is teaching to us. Uh, there's quite a few books around on this sort of subject, but I think uh, I've had some pretty interesting revelations on on what's actually being said, and would like a chance to bring that out to the world. What do you do? And then I'll let you go because I could talk to you for hours, it seems. <laughs> um, what do you do on your dark days if if it's not too personal? I mean, we all have them. We're human here. How, yeah, how, we do. Yeah. How do you get through them through our Lord Jesus? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And look, there's lots of them. Don't, don't kid yourself. I'm not floating along on a cloud. I, I lost my daughter. Like she was hit by a car when she was seven. She was profoundly brain injured. She was in a wheelchair for many years. She died when she was 28 in 2009. Um, that was a beautiful story. You know, like, like she was able to relate to me with what little communication skills she had, that she had experienced an MDE at the time of her accident. She was in a coma for months. Uh, and, and so when she died, I was able to actually sit with her and you know, say, we both know where, where you're going. As she was on her deathbed, which was just so sad but so beautiful at the same right. time. Um, so I still have dark days with that sort of grief coming back on me, particular sure. at times that are important, like the day she had her accident, the day of her birthday, those sorts of things. It, it, it's hard for me to cope with that at those points. But um, there's a particular verse that really talks to me. I, I'm just trying to remember where it is, um, Hosea maybe, but it talks about even when the barn is empty, even when there are no crops in the field, even when there are no sheep, even when things are at their worst, yet I will praise you, Lord. And that that is such an important concept to me. Uh, it's easy to praise God when you've just won the lottery. Right. It's easy to praise God when you've just That's had true. a baby. Right. Yeah. But, but it's talking about praising God in tough times, and that is what I do or try to do when it comes to my mind, uh, is just thank you, God, even in the middle of this storm, I thank you. Even in the middle of this storm, I still honour you. And that really helps. It really does. It's just this will pass. I know this will pass. Mm -hmm. uh, don't let this bring me down because God is good 
and God is full of love and eventually that love will fill me again and I will celebrate again and I will yet praise the Lord, as David said. I started off with that. Oh, my soul, why are you so downcast within me? I will yet live and praise the Lord. And that, I think, is, is the great key and strategy. Look forward, love God, and praise right. God. Is that what you do too when, because like when I get negative thoughts about people, I, I, I get so upset and I immediately ask Jesus for forgiveness. Is is mm. that like a good thing to do to say, you know, Jesus, I'm human, I'm sorry. I I didn't mean to have those thoughts about that person. Is is that- Very, very good. Does yeah. Jesus hear that? Of course he does. He, he hears everything, mate. I just say that's that was my experience. He's aware of everything. No, no exceptions. Like when he said, you know, he knows every hair on your head. He wasn't kidding. He he knows every hair on your head. He knows every detail. I don't know how that works, but that's it's what's happening. Um, yeah, it's the thoughts. It's the thoughts that the intentions of the heart is what God judges us on. And if we're really nasty and vindictive and unforgiving and, and you know, tearing people down and, and abusing people. Yeah, well, that's the sort of thing God doesn't like. That's right. absolutely opposite to what he wants us to be doing. So he doesn't want us to be naive. He doesn't want us to be stupid. Uh, um, sort of, I think some Christians take this too far and they, they're, just, they're just walking targets, if you know yeah. what I mean. Right. Um, he says you still got to, What does he say? You've got to be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. Mm. So you, you've got to be aware of what's going on. Don't be stupid about things, but you've also got to be gentle and loving in what right. you do. I mean, and we have yeah, righteous so, anger too, the way he did yeah, certain yeah, things. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Right. And I can't see anything wrong with righteous anger as long as we don't physically act on it and hurt people. Exactly. I think I think that's that's where you draw the line. But speaking out against evil, I think, is a very good thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, but but being angry with individuals and condemning them, I think, is a very bad thing to do. Right. Uh, that that's the difference. Yeah. So uh, I, I feel sorry for people who are doing evil things. I actually literally feel sorry for them. I, I don't think they really know the full implications of what they're doing. And they will come to regret it very, very deeply at some stage in their life or their death. They will come to regret it very deeply. And I feel I, I would pray that their eyes be opened. That's that's the feeling I have. Right. Uh, even even for people in power, leaders, et cetera, I just pray that their yes. eyes be opened. Right. Right. I mean, although we do get very angry at them at times, but I, I, whenever I do, I just always ask for forgiveness. <laughs> I don't know what else to do, just to to do pray and do that. But you know, yeah. you just talking to you the few times I did, I I just have to say I feel very blessed in the fact that I got to meet you and and have these wonderful conversations with you. They feel very special and very holy, and I really appreciate that. And I I just want you to know how much I do appreciate it. Thank you, Caroline. I'm really enjoying talking about these things with you. It's a rare treat to be able to go into them in such depth, and, and I really thank you for the opportunity. Of course, thank you. And I know that we will cross paths again. Don't forget, you got that book in you, and I want to be like the first person to interview you when you publish it. It may be a little while, but it's certainly it, it's percolating inside me. It, good, it will good. eventually. <laughs> I, th I think it would be a great read. It's good Thank to hear. you so much, Colin. We'll be in touch again. Thank you, Caroline. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. God, God bless you, too.